Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Wherever you are, whatever time it is, welcome to this Holy Thursday, where we'll be reflecting on Jesus as the Lamb of God. But let's once more begin uh, with a prayer, praying the, uh, the Anima Christi prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, Lord, hide me. Permit me not to be separated from thee. From the wicked foe, defend me. At the hour of my death, call me and bid me come to thee, that with thy saints I may praise thee for ever and ever. Amen. For the readings today, I'm going to take a section of the uh, first reading for uh, the evening's liturgy from the book of Exodus about the Passover and from the second reading from 1 Corinthians about the Eucharist. So from the book of Exodus, chapter 12. On the 10th day of the month, each man must take an animal from the flock. It must be an animal without blemish, a male one year old. You may take it from either sheep or goats. You must keep it till the 14th day of the month when the whole assembly shall slaughter it between the two evenings. Some of the blood must then be taken and put on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where it is eaten. That night the flesh is to be eaten, roasted over the fire. It is a Passover in honour of the Lord. That night I will go through the land of Egypt and strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. The blood shall serve to mark the houses that you live in. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and you shall escape the destroying plague when I strike the land of Egypt. And from 1 Corinthians 11. On the same night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and thanked God for it and broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this as a memorial of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this as a memorial of me. The word of the Lord. In these readings for Holy Thursday, we have an intricate nexus of images and ideas. Passover, Last Supper, Eucharist. The Catechism speaks about some of these links in this rich paragraph from 1340. By celebrating the Last Supper with his apostles in the course of a Passover meal, Jesus gave the Jewish Passover its definitive meaning. Jesus passing over to his father by his death and resurrection, the new Passover, is anticipated in the supper and celebrated in the Eucharist, which fulfills the Jewish Passover and anticipates the final Passover of the church in the glory of the kingdom. There's a lot packed into that paragraph, so let's just separate out the different elements a little in a diagram. That paragraph starts with the Passover. And then it uh, talks about its link to the supper. It says that the Passover, that the Last Supper gives definitive meaning to the Passover. Then moves on to talk about the cross and the way in which the Last Supper anticipates the cross. 
Jesus' Passover, his cross and resurrection, in fact, Jesus passing over to the Father once more. So the cross is anticipated by the Last Supper and it is celebrated in the Eucharist. Then it moves on to talk about the links between the Eucharist and some other elements. It speaks about the link between the Eucharist and the Passover, that the Passover is fulfilled by the Eucharist. And then it looks to the wedding supper of the Lamb, the heavenly banquet, and talks about how the Eucharist anticipates uh, the wedding supper of the Lamb. So all these connections, Passover given meaning by the Last Supper, anticipating the cross which is celebrated in the Eucharist, which itself is the fulfillment of the Passover and the uh, anticipation of the wedding supper of the Lamb. There's a further connection between these elements that St. Paul makes in another part of 1 Corinthians in chapter 5 verse 7, where he says, Christ our Paschal Lamb has been sacrificed. He sees Christ as the fulfillment of the Passover sacrifice we heard about in that first reading from Exodus. When John the Baptist sees Jesus coming towards him for the first time in the Gospel of John, he also refers to him as a lamb. Here is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the first testimony about Jesus given by any person, any human person in John's Gospel. And it's given by the greatest of the prophets, John the Baptist. He intends it to color all that we read about Jesus in that gospel. That title, Lamb of God, becomes an important title for Jesus in the church, a title we use in three separate parts of the mass. In the Gloria, we pray, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, taking up those words of John the Baptist, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. Later on, we have a part of the Mass which we call by the same title that the Baptist gave to Jesus, the Lamb of God, or the Agnus Dei. As the bread of life is broken so that we can receive him, we pray three times to Jesus in those words of John, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, asking him to have mercy on us and to grant us peace. And soon after that, just before communion, the priest holds up the host and proclaims with the Baptist, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So let's spend a bit of time looking at the three strands of thought woven into this image of Jesus as the Lamb of God, all of which combine to deepen our understanding of who Jesus is and that nexus of connections which arise in our readings for this celebration of Holy Thursday. We start with the Passover Lamb, which we've already mentioned. When God was ready to set his people free from their captivity in Egypt. He commanded each family to take a lamb and to do three things with it. To sacrifice it, separating its body from its blood, to spread the blood on the doorposts and lintels of their houses, and to eat the body of the lamb that night. The blood would be the sign that the angel of God should pass over these houses and keep them safe from the destruction that was to come. When the destruction did come, the Egyptians were ready to let the Israelites go at last, and so they made their escape after many years of slavery. Then year by year, God told the people of Israel to continue to remember and celebrate this occasion eating a lamb as the ancestors had done on that first Passover. And through this ritual, remembering all the ways in which God had freed them in the past and had continued to free them from any harm of any sort. 
but they were not just to remember this as something that had happened in the past. Rather, they understood that the Passover sacrifice, each time it was renewed, made each generation spiritual participants in that original exodus. As they celebrated the Passover liturgy, God's act of deliverance of the people was made present to them. John the Baptist's naming of Jesus as the Lamb of God in the first chapter of John's Gospel opens up a range of connections that Gospel makes between Jesus and the Passover Lamb. The Gospel is structured around three Passover celebrations in Jerusalem. At the first Passover in John chapter 2, Jesus clears the temple. At the second Passover in John chapter 6, Jesus multiplies the loaves and speaks about himself as the bread of life. The third Passover is mentioned in the gospel for today, which I didn't read. It forms the setting for Jesus' passion and death. As these events are prepared for and then unfold, we're reminded on 10 separate occasions that it is the time of the Passover festival. But John doesn't just make a generic connection between Jesus and the Passover ceremony. He also makes specific connections between Jesus and the Passover lamb. The whole point of the Passover pilgrimage to Jerusalem was to take your Paschal lamb to the priests who would slaughter and prepare it for the Passover feast. John is at pains to point out that Jesus' crucifixion occurred precisely on this day of preparation when the lambs were being slaughtered in the temple. Three times he makes this point. Firstly, when Pilate is taking his seat on the judge's bench um, on the stone pavement, he says it was the day of preparation. Then at the death of Jesus, the story again points out that it was the day the Passover lambs were killed. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and bodies removed. Here, by the way, the fact that Jesus had already died and did not need to have his legs broken points to another connection with the Passover lamb. For as we heard in that reading, for the Israelites that were commanded not to break any of the bones of the animals they were slaughtering for the Passover. And finally, when Jesus is taken from the cross, we're reminded once more that it was the Jewish day of preparation. For John then, the first meaning of the Baptist statement, here is the Lamb of God, is that Jesus is the true Passover Lamb. Jesus is the one who brings to fulfillment God's plan of liberation and salvation, that plan which began that first Passover night when God protected his people from death and rescued them from slavery in Egypt. Jesus, like the Passover lamb, is about liberation, freedom, salvation. The second allusion in the Baptist's description of Jesus as the Lamb of God comes from the songs of the suffering servant in Isaiah, which are used as the first reading for many of the liturgies during Holy Week. They are texts that the church from its earliest days has found helpful in understanding the mystery of Christ's suffering and death. The lamb reference comes in the context of this passage from Isaiah, which is read at the Good Friday celebration of the Passion. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. We accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises we are healed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He was cut off from the land of the living 
My servant shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. He poured out himself to death. Three points seem significant here. Firstly, the suffering servant is as innocent as a lamb going to be slaughtered. He had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. What he suffers is not the result of any bad or evil choices on his part, any dividedness within him, any complicity in violence or destructiveness. What he suffers is entirely the effect of the sins of others, the effects of our sins, the results of our resentment, our violence, our self-pity, our injustice, our selfishness, our shame, our rejection of God. He has borne our infirmities, carried our diseases. He stands with us as he stood with us at his baptism, standing shoulder to shoulder with sinners indistinguishable from them, numbered with the transgressors. And he stands with us to the end, ready to bear whatever burdens this solidarity with sinners will entail. That innocence is portrayed in this lamb here, the image of the lamb and John the Baptist pointing to Jesus once more as the lamb of God, and seeing how that naming of him is really fulfilled in particular in the crucifixion here. Secondly, Jesus does this goes through all this for our salvation. His suffering made us whole and by his bruises we are healed. He does it so that we might have life and have it to the full. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. And thirdly, Jesus does this freely out of love. A lamb has no choice in whether it will be sacrificed. It's simply overpowered by a greater force. It has its life taken from it. Not so the lamb of God. Jesus says, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down. Power to lay down my life. That great power, the power to surrender, to let oneself go into the hands of God to give oneself completely in self-gift. I have the power to lay my life down, Jesus says. And he goes on, I have the power to take it up again. This is the third image of the lamb. We have seen the liberating lamb, the lamb standing with the transgressors. Now we have the victorious resurrected lamb bringing about God's final victory. In scripture, this lamb features in the book of Revelation. And again, there are three relevant points here. Firstly, this lamb had been slain. In Revelation five, we read, then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. And having been slain, having given up its lifeblood, that blood had become a source of life and blessing for the world. As that chapter goes on, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the lamb. They sing a new song. You are worthy for you were slaughtered and by your blood, you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God and they will reign on earth. Still, though it had been slain, this lamb is now very much, this lamb is now very much alive, having been victorious over death. And this victory he shares with the blessed. We read that those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb have now been freed from suffering by the lamb. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes.
they are freed from all suffering and freed to be able to worship this lamb who is the center of heavenly worship. I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands singing with full voice. Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Finally, this lamb, this is a lamb whose wedding supper is the culmination of God's plan. Then I heard the voice of a great multitude crying out, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. To her, it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. Then one of the seven angels came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And in the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It is the glory of God. It has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel. And the wall of the city has 12 foundations and on them are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the lamb. And it continues its description of this heavenly Jerusalem this bride of the lamb. I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the almighty and the lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God is its light and the lamb is the la and its lamp is the lamb. The nations will walk by its light. Its gates will never be shut. There'll be no night there. people will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. We, the church, are that bride, the bride of Christ. Intimate covenant communion with Christ is our goal, our end, the fulfillment of our every real desire. And that marriage lamb, that marriage relationship has begun. Our marriage covenant with him began in baptism. It's renewed in every Eucharist. Our body united with his, our soul with his, our humanity with his divinity. As we noted earlier, the mass anticipates the final Passover of the church in the glory of the kingdom. But more than anticipating heaven, in the mass we are already united to the worship of the saints in heaven, as the catechism also notes. By the Eucharistic celebration, we already unite ourselves with the heavenly liturgy and anticipate eternal life when God will be all in all. This image is one attempt to capture something of that unity of us when we are at mass, when the mass is being celebrated with the heavenly Jerusalem, with the angels and saints there, heaven breaking open and earth being united. As that quote said, we already unite ourselves with the heavenly liturgy. The Jesus we receive in the Eucharist is the lamb once slain who now lives forever. The lamb who saves and liberates. The lamb who has carried our burdens as the suffering servant. The lamb leading us to our ultimate fulfillment in him as he shares his risen life with us. 
He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed indeed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. So there we are, brothers and sisters. Once again, I'd encourage you if something from those different readings from the Passover story, from the account in Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11 of the uh, Eucharist, one of the earliest accounts that we have in scripture, uh, or from the, the uh, suffering servant songs, which are in the readings for this week, or from the book of Revelation, the lamb once slain, looking forward, I suppose, already to pass the uh, crucifixion and suffering to the resurrection and the ultimate fulfillment in heaven. Wherever your heart is drawn, or simply to be with Jesus uh, on this day as he enters into his passion and to uh, pour out your heart with whatever you're carrying, just uh, to be united with him at this time. I'm praying for you over this time of retreat. I don't think I've mentioned that before, but uh, I'm uh, offering prayers for you. Uh, and uh, I hope you're all going well. God bless you. And may the blessing of Almighty God come upon you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Take care. Bye.